can hear me, I can hear myself, but I can't see anything <laughs> from up here. Anyway, um, welcome, Dame Kay. Thank you for coming and talking with us this evening in such an informal uh, environment approach. Uh, much appreciated. Um, welcome, distinguished guests. I'm sure there are other distinguished guests out there. Uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Welcome to the gathering of the Bio family, Bio City family. Although since we acquired New Haven in Scotland, we tend to call it the Bio City clan. <laughs> it's quite remarkable, you know, and the company only started here in 2003, some 11 years ago. Started off with a handful of people We'll talk about some of those uh, in a moment. But um, in that rather short space of time, we have provided an environment for 200 companies and 1,000 employees. And please don't think of us as providing facilities, equipment, etc. We really create the environment in which ideas can germinate they can foster, they can grow. Entrepreneurs can realize their dreams, ambitions. Some of them are quite remarkable also. And uh, many of them, I think, have a better chance of being successful in what they seek to achieve because of the record we have of companies that found themselves in environments such as this. The long-term survival of a company in this environment is 91%, is about 50% higher than the national uh, average. So please, if you have ideas, uh, if you have businesses, if you have science that you want to bring through to the marketplace to improve the lives of patients, do think of Biocity as providing the right potential environment for your business, somewhere to nurture those ideas. I just want to touch on a few highlights uh, of the year. And I want to start with uh, the Biohub. In fact, it's our, um, I think of it as our most recent uh, opportunity, although MediCity, in fact, came a little later than it. And the Biohub, you know, BioCity is a group of people. Again, not facilities. Biohub is run by Ned Wakeman, who's the director in charge of that site. I don't know, Ned if you might be able to show your, spa your face. If anyone turns around, they won't see you. But, um, you know, at Biohub, we did something, again, quite remarkable recently. We were gifted five million pounds by AstraZeneca, with whom we set up the enterprise, uh, to ensure that we could not only uh, coach companies, we could not only provide the right environment for the companies, but we actually could begin to invest in them. And we have a good track record of starting companies, growing those companies, and indeed realizing capital from investing in those companies at BioCity. We haven't been able to do it as frequently as we would have liked, but going forward, look on the Biohub as the start of that new phase of activity for um, BioCity. And then um, MediCity, which we set up also in 2013. David Browning is responsible for that, and I think he's somewhere around. Thank you, uh, David. You know, what is it? After 12 months, he's hosting an event with 550 uh, delegates, 35 speakers over a week long, uh, and a sequence of seminars, workshops, uh, and talks. You know, robots designed to help autistic children. Social media campaign for diabetics. And then, of course, the bite that blend in smoothies. <laughs> and I thought the only smoothies on bites are in the city of London. <laughs> and by a city, Scotland, um, um, most recent uh, MD, Diane Harbison, and Diane, I know, is uh, also with us this year. 
quite remarkably, she's got money out of George Osborne. She and Glenn have got money out of George Osborne. We were quite surprised uh, just a few months ago hearing rumours that we might get the capital to establish a medi city in Scotland. And out of the blue, George Osborne announced it. And uh, we were taken by surprise somewhat, but a very delightful surprise. Because I think part of the model of Bias City is taking what we do well in one location and not so much exporting that as planting fresh seeds in other locations. And so MediCity, which is a joint venture with Boots in Nottingham here, will be working very closely with Diane on MediCity uh, Scotland. I think I've mentioned everyone, I've mentioned everyone, well, everyone except for one person. You don't do this without strong, creative, ingenious, I won't swear, but really hard-working <laughs> individuals, and we have an exemplary individual of that nature in our leadership, and it's Glenn Crocker. So, Glenn, maybe most people know you, but please, Show yourself. <laughs> I mean, Glenn started by a city. You know, I've been working with him for four years, and it, it's not just the creativity, the ingenuity, it's, it's the sheer hard work and effort that goes into it, and the way he works with his people. He's a great delegator, and people rise uh, to the occasion. When he, when, he, when he dumps things on them. <laughs> and we're not the only ones who think highly of Glenn. I'm delighted to say that in this year's Bertie Honours list, Glenn was honoured with uh, the award of an MBA, MBE. So well done, Glenn. Well deserved and um, enjoy it. Hope it looks good on the mantelpiece. <laughs> so thank you. Now I'm going to hand over to Toby. And uh, Toby will introduce our uh, guest discussant, I think we can call you tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis, and uh, good evening and warm welcome to you all. Well, welcome to BioCity Nottingham. Um, my next job is, and it's a great privilege and pleasure, uh, pleasure to invite to the stage uh, the Dr. Lee's. Professor of Anatomy at Oxford University, a Fellow of Hartford College, Director of MRC Functional Gen Genetics Unit, a Governor of the Wellcome Trust, a Director of the Oxford Centre for Gene Function, and not only that, a Fellow of the Royal Society and, in addition, Executive Editor of the journal Human Molecular Genetics. Please, ladies and gentlemen, will you give a warm BioCity welcome to Professor Dame Kay Davis. So with all of those job titles, there's clearly a lot for us to be able to talk about, um, and we'll have plenty of time to do that. But I wondered if you might start just by helping us set the scene a little bit um, and telling us a little bit more about um, schooling, upbringing, and, and the early years. Um, you were at um, Gig Mill School in Stourbridge to begin with, is that correct? Yeah. So uh, we lived on a council estate that had a junior school and an infant school adjacent to each other. That we could walk to school or cycle to school past the gobstopper shop on the way. <laughs> um, and so my two brothers uh, and I used to walk to school. Yeah. Uh, and was just a general education. A general, and, and was, that, was it a school that was particularly strong in science? Or where did, that, where did your uh, kind of interest in science Certainly not at the, uh, the infant and, and the junior school. The junior school, the headmaster was very good at maths. So he would walk in and, and pose a problem uh, to the class. And I was always very good at maths. So I kind of had a feeling that you know, I might be able to do something with that background fairly early on, but certainly no science. Okay. But was there, I, I, I understand there was a chemistry teacher as well that was a... That was at the high school. Session. That came later that, on at the high school. That came later on, yes. So tell us a bit, that was Miss Presley. That's exactly right, yeah. yes. Who loved golf, but also loved chemistry. So yeah. she had this great uh, love of life, as well as the love of the science subject. And there were only four of us doing A-levels in chemistry, physics and maths in, in those days. 
In fact, they tried very hard to make me do languages all the way through to a sixth form. Um, and so she was transformational because she used to let us do all sorts of chemistry experiments, practicals that you probably couldn't do now because of health and safety. And, that, <laughs> and I survived. Yeah. Yeah. And so you survived, which is good. Yes. And so health and safety would have gotten away with that sort of learning and maybe that, that yes. peaking of your interest in those early years. What, what, where was the pressure to do languages rather than science? Well, I think the whole school was orientated towards languages. And also there was a realisation, because I was so good at maths rather than at science, that I might go to Oxbridge. And for that, you had to do Latin. Uh, and in the, that particular high school, you could either do Latin or biology. So I never did any biology uh, at A-level or actually then I did chemistry first degree at the university. So I didn't do biology until I did my research year in my chemistry degree. And we'll, we'll come to that um, undergraduate study in a moment. But uh, again, just coming back to the kind of, you know, what sparked the interest in science. Do you think it was always there? I mean, were your parents pushy or uh, were they scientists? My parents or? weren't pushy. I think one of the great things about my family background was they never expected me to achieve what I've achieved. So almost anything I did, they were very encouraging about. And it was clear that I had a biological bent but I could never quite get there just because of the structure of the educational system yeah. and going to the high school. Okay. And my brothers weren't scientists, but my mother certainly had, you know, she, she's great at, at gardening. Actually, she's nearly blind now, so she can't advise me, but she can still spot the weeds. But she can also <laughs> produce all the Latin names. So she was a true uh, botanist, if you like. Right. Uh, and the strength of the, the mathemat mathematics, I think, really came from my father. Okay. And if you'd done biology instead of Latin, do you think that would have changed things at all? Uh, no, because I think the work ethic comes from maths and chemistry and right. physics, actually. Okay. Uh, I shouldn't say biology is a, a soft subject, but I think you can... <laughs> not, not, not with so many biologists in you the audience. Can, no, absolutely. And I would count myself as one amongst those now. But yeah. I think you can learn it, and it changes so fast. But the, the fundamentals, if you don't do either medicine or the fundamental sciences, mm. I mean, I think that really has helped me a lot. Yeah. And so you went from Stourbridge to, to Oxford, yes. um, a number of, a small, I assume, a small handful of, of pupils who went to Oxford. Yeah, there's one other person before me that went from the high school to and do no chemistry at some of them, actually, exactly the same exactly time. Exactly the same. But nobody in your family had been previously? No, no. no. So oh, what no, sorry. Yes. My uncle had been to St. Peter's to do economics okay. and philosophy. So you had a, a bit of an inkling as to what so it might be like when you arrived? No, or was it I, had all no, just I had no idea. Right. And actually, the first term was very hard because if you come from a working class background and you didn't get straight A's at O level, uh, then you were really out. Yeah. Uh, so everybody came from a, a fee paying school and they'd all got top A's and I found that very intimidating. Plus the fact there were 20 females in a class of 200 males in chemistry. Right. And that's hard, it may sound ideal, but it's <laughs> actually <laughs> And did that, did that spark a competitive element in your nature, do you think? I've always been competitive. Yeah. And I think I, my mother hated the fact that Desert Island Disc, I said I was driven and I got it from her, but I do. <laughs> and I think I can't sit still. And I remember sitting on the stairs at home and doing the mathematical problems for my homework. However hard they were, I wasn't going to bed till I'd solved them. So I've always been uh, competitive. But particularly I've been driven, I think. Mm. And so, you, and so you arrive in Oxford at Somerville, and that's where you did chemistry as your yes. first subject. And then after that? I did. Well, it's a four-year course, so you could choose where you did your fourth year. And I was very fortunate in having a biological tutor, because the one-to-one -one teaching was enormously helpful to me, yeah. who encouraged me to think of a biology project. So I moved into the biochemistry department to do that fourth year. And then uh, I eventually decided to stay on and do a PhD. And that led to um, a move to Paris as well, I believe. Uh, yeah, I was following my husband that, at the time, the time actually. Yeah. But it's and not a bad place to go. Very uh, nice, I imagine. Both yeah. for the science and for the fact that uh, yeah. it was a beautiful city. And, and what were you doing during your time in Paris? Well, I didn't know anything about, much about biology. I didn't know enough about proteins. And so I decided I need to go to a protein lab uh, to learn a little bit about uh, macromolecular structures, because mm -hmm. I was doing a cell division project actually a chromatin structural project in Ian Walker's lab. Uh, and I was very fortunate because I ended up in a yeast lab where they were trying to clone the first genes for RNA polymerase. Right. And for that, you know, nobody got the enzymes. You can buy them in kits now. Uh, and so we <coughs> went to the Pasteur a lot to collect you know, all the sorts of enzymes you need to 
do genetic engineering, even before that had been accepted, actually, mm. in most countries. And so how did that translate into your move back to the UK then? Well, did you that's because uh, Steve, my then husband, mm. was a, a workaholic chemist, still is a workaholic chemist, um, and he was offered a lectureship back in Oxford. And actually, uh, Oxford was so sexist in those days, I said I didn't want to go back to Oxford straight away, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Um, and because we played bridge with uh, someone from London, uh, it's a long story, but we played bridge, and so Bob Williamson said to me, you should try genetics. Yeah. I didn't even know what a chromosome was, I'm ashamed to say. Uh, but some really key papers, it was a very exciting time when people realised, well, maybe we can find the genes for some of these other diseases yeah. in, a, in a way that we couldn't do before with cloning. Yeah. And so I read that up and moved back to St Mary's and commuted from Oxford to London, to London on a daily basis to do that. And as you say, a very exciting time. I, when I read about it, I think about it, I, a lot of scientific discovery and debate seemed to happen in pubs in those days as well. Well, Both they did happen. Well, those are the days when you could have a drink, of, you could have half a pint of lager at half past five and still catch the six o'clock train because the trains weren't crowded and you could still get a seat and you could get people to save you seats. Yeah. So, yes, the spirit of St Mary's was very strong. Yeah. And this was, this was these days here, wasn't it? Uh, no, that, no, that, was, that was the genetics lab so in Oxford. I'll to come to that later. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as a, yeah, in a very exciting time, and notes on the back of beer mats, half a lager well, at half five. And, and, and also, you know, Bob was, has had an entrepreneur, so he never set up a company. But you could say to Bob, I need this, and he would find someone who'd do it somewhere in the country. Right. And he came from Glasgow, so quite a lot of the initial work in developing the first diagnostic test for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is my main research I've been working yeah. on, was actually Brian Young in Glasgow in the Beetson Institute had this uh, uh, way of sorting chromosomes so we could get X chromosomes because we knew it was on the X because it only affects males. Mm -hmm. So we used to spend all the way through the night tr to trying to tune this uh, oscilloscope to try and get these chromosomes to sort. And is this what led to then scanning fetuses for in that, That's exactly right. Who and so Bob always had this clinical context because he had contacts with everybody. Um, and so that was enormously helpful. And so you must have felt part of a much wider ecosystem of people that were working at the frontier of... Well, yes, because the clinicians were... Actually, the best clinician was in Cardiff, and the best person to purify chromosomes was in Glasgow. But actually, Bob invited me back to the country to study cystic fibrosis, because that's what he'd got money for. And cystic fibrosis, he thought, and still does, actually, is more important than DMD, because it affects more people, because one in 20 people are carriers. Mm. Um, but the problem was we didn't know which chromosome it was on and we didn't know where to start. So we drove up and down the country and bled every cystic fibrosis patient we could find. And that's where I learned how tragic genetic disease can be mm. in, in certain families. And we realised we couldn't do it for CF, that we'd have to start with a disease where we knew which chromosome it was on, even though we didn't know what the gene was. And that's why we chose uh, DMD. And it was Paul Walker, then executive chairman of the muscular dystrophy, uh, campaign that persuaded us that DMD would be the model system for CF and that's how I met my first patient and I guess that's why I haven't looked back. And that's how you locked in on it. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, so it's the most severe form of muscular dystrophy. Just yes, tell us is. a bit more about the, the disease. It's, it's a tragic muscle wasting disease because a lot of the patients don't show any phenotype and, and to, unless you're looking for it until they have difficulty walking upstairs, which can often be when they're as late as three or four, and other affected boys may have be in the family. Mm. They're going to a wheelchair no later really than 12, and these days, because of really good respiratory care, they can last into their late 20s. Uh, but when I started on this disease, most of them died before 20. Mm. Most of them now, uh, the mean age is about 22. But it's tragic because they, they, first of all, they can't walk, and then they can't, even with computers, it's when they lose the use of their hands, they're no longer independent, yeah. and they can no longer do the computer games. Yeah. Uh, so it's a really hard uh, life, even with the support of their very good families. And so that's how you kind of arrived at DMD. Do you, is it, does it become kind of personal now? Um, do you see it almost as a kind of a, a foe to be defeated? Are you kind uh, of, yes. you know, really bloody-minded about Absolutely. tackling it? Yeah, because you and your group at Oxford do um, cover a much wider area around muscle disease and yes, we do. And we've worked on we've got programs on sleep and and schizophrenia, for example, yeah. 
uh, but now I'm becoming, if I'm going to achieve that goal, I've got to be completely focused. Yeah. And I think with the company now, it, it's a completely different way of doing the science in order to get there, because mm -hmm. we won't get there soon enough otherwise. Okay. So we'll come back to perhaps where um, we are with clinical trials and, and the progress that's being made there at the moment. But just to change tack slightly for a moment, um, you describe yourself as driven. You said you got it from your mother. Do you, are you working weekends, evenings? What do you, do you, do you have downtime at all? Do you, how do you kind of You're just very well organised. So you do all the other stuff as well as, I mean, I think it, the turning point in my life was when I was pregnant and Nick was born. And then you realise if you got into the lab at eight and you had to get home at half past five because that's when the nanny or the au pair went home, you just did it. Mm. And sometimes you went back to the lab and whenever you needed it, you went back to the lab. Uh, but you always went back. Uh, or you went on the computer. Actually, you couldn't remote in like you do now. Yeah. But I have a postdoc now from France who, you know, I have to say good night, Simon, at 10.30, because <laughs> he's still sending me emails about the data. And I feel slightly guilty, but it's, it's, it's the driven young people that work with you that keep you going. Yeah, think. absolutely. Um, and, and so what do you, just out of interest, what do you like to do outside of work then? What, uh, walking. What, walking? Uh, is, yeah. And music's walking a love as well, music, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, I play the piano very badly, which is why it's in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> How many hours attention does the piano get? Oh, it's week? probably only a couple of hours a week, actually. But you know, getting out and going to the theatre or going to concerts is, yeah. is more likely. Yeah. And do you? Um, so we're talking about kind of motivation and, and being driven. Are there days when you know things are going against you? It's it's not working out as you hoped, and and you you don't want to get out in bed in the morning. You you know you you you're coming close to giving up the fight, or is that never even cross your mind? I it's a ro well, research is always a roller coaster, but mm. I don't think, I think the mission always keeps you going. And actually, one of the reasons of doing multidisciplinary research and having these other projects is that it's never all down all at the same time. Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, you hope it isn't. Yeah. Uh, and it rarely is. And that, yeah. So somebody will always come in with a good result. Yeah. And so, um, I, I'd probably just to, to finish off on that topic. I mean, the vast majority of well, everybody in this room, the vast majority of people would be delighted, I guess, with a career that accomplished a, a fraction of what you've done so far, but you are still working the hours and, and putting the effort in. Where do you need to go? What do you need to achieve to be able to kind of retire, retire happy, content? I'm not sure. <laughs> You're not going to okay, retire, I'm not going to retire. <laughs> but I am going to slow down. <laughs> so uh, the honest question to that is, I've always been interested in the ethical uh, implications of the research. So I was always I was on the genetic advisory committee. I did the report for the government on the impact of the human genome because I was interested, and uh, I'm interested in. I'm on the board now of Genome England, which is sequencing 100,000 genomes. And I think I can now help younger people. Uh, well, I can facilitate the research outside my own field while pioneering some of the approaches in Duchenne muscular dystrophy itself. Mm. And so, you know, the reason I wanted to become a, a governor of the Wellcome Trust is that you can think on a much broader, um, well, you can think about global medicine, so I do quite a lot of genetics in, in Africa. This, it's so enabling to be able to fund young people now. Mm. So, that does, that's, so that's two days a week, is being deputy chairman of the Wellcome Trust. But it, it isn't, you know, it's all up here because it's, it's the experience that I've got that I can then give out to other people as opposed to it being another job. It's mm. all part of the same job, so which is genetics, which is the best field yet. So I, think a, I guess there's a desire for almost kind of session planning, but ensuring that the work continues and that the, yes. the framework's in place and the right people are, are around and so can continue it. So you're not having to be there every day doing it. I think the other thing is uh, leadership is very important. So I set up a, I did not set up a leadership program, but I facilitated, it was my idea to set up a leadership program within the Wellcome Trust, which we launched over the last two years. Because quite a lot of young academics find it quite difficult, and women in particular, mm. to try and take these uh, managerial roles. I think it was easier for me when I was coming through to do that. And not just because I was the only woman, just because that's what you did. And I think it's m the pressure to publish papers, get grants, is much appears to be much harder now than it was then, although it felt pretty hard even, even then. then. Yeah. Well, you obviously took it very well. Um, I wonder if we can kind of um, change topic slightly now and, and turn to kind of the, the translational element of research and the commercialization of science, the kind of bench to bedside, um, if you will. 
Um, I know that you've worked um, with a lot of DMD patient groups and sufferers and, and carers. Um, tell us a little bit about that, because I'm really interested in the connection between researcher and patient. Um, I want to know, is it, is it necessary, does it inform, improve the quality of the research? Well, I think in the future it will improve it a lot, because unless you've got to understand the phenotype, you're really not going to develop. And it's particularly true in Parkinson's disease. Most people think that is a motor deficit, and actually one of the biggest problems that those patients have is the cognitive deficit, and I only learned that by a patient being a representative on a board of a company. Uh, in DMD, you just need to understand what the most important things are for them in their lives. Does it make a difference, even though they're already in a wheelchair, that they can move their arms, which I've already mentioned? The answer mm. is it does, and it does a lot. Because mm. this is treatment rather than cure in this Yeah, in this but the instance. other thing is, of course, you need the samples. Yeah. You need the muscle biopsies, and actually it's tough for these patients to participate in trials, so they need to be able to trust us. And they need to, under, you know, they, with the internet, they understand the disease far more. But that must, the connection with them and the face-to-face -face yes. contact must bring a much, must have a heavy burden of responsibility and expectation on you as a result of it. Is it not easier to be detached? Um, I'm not, well, it, it would be. I think the best advice I ever had was from a Duchenne patient parent who said to me, Don't, you, know, you can get up there and tell us what the latest in research is but you mustn't destroy hope. Right. And that's why you don't give timescales. Actually, we can more confidently give timescales now because we can say, well, I don't know whether this treatment will work, but I'll be able to tell you in five years or six years because you can roughly guess uh, where that clinical trial will come to an end. Um, and you'd be surprised how motivated they are, even though they know the treatment is not necessarily going to affect their sons, uh, it gives them a mission. And even the patients themselves now are participating uh, in these patient uh, annual meetings that we have, right. there's one in the UK, where we had two speakers, 125 and 129 this time, that have now, because of the way that these patients are surviving, they have their own support groups. What is life like when you've done a PhD at Duchenne patient? I mean, when I began this disease 25 years ago, nobody would have dreamed that that was a, a reality for any patient at all. Mm. And so you mentioned um, timescales and, and clinical trials. Um, to advance the translation of that research, you mentioned forming a, a company with your then husband, Professor yes. Stephen Davis, at the Summit PLC. Just tell us a little bit about that. Why did you feel that was necessary? How did it come about? Well, um, we, we realised that we needed to do some chemical screening, and we didn't have any of the robotics those days that they sell now uh, mm. routinely. And we couldn't get any big farmer interested in DMD at that stage. I mean, can't believe how it's changed, uh, even in the last five years. And we were very lucky because Steve had identified uh, how you could make asymmetric molecules on solid state surfaces, because he's a medicinal chemist. Mm -hmm. um, and so he set up his the first company. So we put money into the first company, and it was business angels, actually, in a champagne party, in, like the one out there, um, <laughs> that we just talked about his research and right and left-hand molecules. And they were so fascinated by that that Ian Lang and Nick Cross funded that company to start <coughs> off with. Uh, and, you know, that was just us and, and somebody to uh, make the coffee. And Tim Cook, who did all the other jobs, like the account, the finance, etc. Right. So we started that company and then eventually was taken over. And so, fortunately, by that time, Steve realised how important DMD was to him, too, I think, because mm. he'd met one or two uh, uh, patients. So we decided to try and use some of our own money uh, to, to set that company up and we got a few more business angels together. And that was then, so that was the formation of Summit? That was Vastox PLC. Right. And uh, then we, then that company diversified for, because uh, CEOs have different agendas. <laughs> and very, we've got a great CEO now who's brought it back into focus. So the company's focused on CD for seal and DMD only. Yeah. But we were greatly helped again. I went to give a talk at Cold Spring Harbour and Jim Watson was in the audience. Um, and he came up to me afterwards and said, it's a fantastic idea to use this protein that is related to the one that's missing. Yep. Uh, why don't I get some bankers from Cold Spring Harbour to fund it? I know someone who's got Becker muscular dystrophy, which is the milder form of the disease. And so they persuaded OSI Pharmaceuticals to, s to set up a cell screen for us, and we really had never done that before. But of course, we learned through that process. And when o OSI turned out to be very uh, successful, they didn't want to do DMD anymore, at least their shareholders didn't want yeah, them to. Right. But they were generous enough to give us absolutely all the resources they developed on that program 
to set up Vastox, which then uh, became Summit's PLC. Yeah, okay. And uh, so you're, the company's aim listed now, um, yep. but it, it, I, I believe it receives quite a bit of money from DMD Charitable Foundation. Yes, as well. it does, for the clinical trials. Yeah, yes, and now does. has that, um, do you think that's sort of a result of your direct involvement with <coughs> groups, or, or do you think that's a trend for funding of? No, I think that's the trend it. for funding rare diseases. And in fact, it's not the only program they funded. They funded uh, the EU and some of the charities have funded ProSensor, that there's an Exxon skipping, and the uh, and PT therapy. Actually, uh, PPMD, Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy in the States, gave $13 million to something called Project Catalyst, which was uh, something that PT Therapeutics uh, founded mm. to find one of the therapies for DMD. But they realised that if they didn't get a, a substantial amount of money into this company, they'd probably never develop the drug. And of course, that's now uh, been approved in some countries. Yes. And do you, um, so that happens a lot in the States, probably less so in this country at the moment, that kind of venture philanthropy? Yeah, venture, uh, venture philanthropy is much more difficult. Yeah. But it does seem to bring additional benefits in that you have the insight um, with, of the patients, but probably higher demands as well in terms of timescales for delivery and... Well, I think, I'm not sure I have any greater insight, but we still have international collaborations. It's just that we're the only people that are using this particular approach. But it's, it's friendly competition, so I'm on the board of ProSensor oh, okay. uh, to do the Exxon skipping, because in the end, I doubt if it's one approach that'll win. It'll be a combination approach. You have to do a little bit of this and then a little bit of that in order to really come out with an effective treatment for the for this particular disease. And so you very briefly mentioned your approach, just to expand on that a little bit for us, because your discovery was around the protein dystrophin um, failing to express in muscle cells. Right. Um, but you discovered a similar protein that right. had a similar effect. Can you tell us a bit more so about that? So this goes, you, you, you lose the first battle. And the first, so we were racing, there's Ron Wharton in Canada and Lou Kunkel in Boston, and my, my group, trying to find the dystrophin gene first. And those two won ahead of me. Uh, for a whole variety of reasons, some, some of it actually clever uh, science. But in fact, when they did do that, they shared it. But it's a, a very large gene, so it took all of the three groups um, at least two years to, f you know, to, to put the whole thing together. This mm -hmm. was before you could uh, have PCR. I can't mm. believe you can't have PCR, but anyway. Um, and so we were racing to find other bits of the dystrophin gene when we picked up this gene uh, core, which we called eutrophin because it's expressed everywhere as opposed to dystrophin, which is only expressed in muscle. And we couldn't believe it when we sequenced it because it took, it, I mean, it shows 80% homology. Mm. And actually in the, in the business end of the molecule, which really now functionally we know is so important, it's 95% similar. And so this is your, the, the SMT C1100? <coughs> uh, modulates, the exp increases the expression of that. Of, of, the, of that particular protein. And that's what's in development with Summit yes. at the moment. Um, phase one trials in healthy volunteers in 2012. Yep. 1B um, started November last year and finished yep. earlier this year. What, what was the outcome? The of outcome of that was that, again, it was well tolerated by the patients. That was just a safety thing. Mm -hmm. But we also realised that the absorbance of this drug depended on diet, which we didn't realise when we did it in the normal adult control. So we're just mm -hmm. about to start another 1B, or rather summit are, yeah. uh, just to sort that one out. And is that a clear conclusion or is that a kind of an assumption based on... Um, uh, no, that's based on, on the evidence from the, from the phase one. Yeah. But we've also, of course, you can do clever f uh, formulations of drugs, and so we can probably increase uh, the uh, availability of that fivefold just by changing the formulation. Mm. And you, um, I think you, you, you touched on it a moment ago, but that I, I'm interested in this kind of, you start off in an academic environment where it's all extremely collaborative, and then those, you know, those opportunities get spun out, and then it feels like sometimes it's a bit of a race. You know, you mentioned um, PTC Therapeutics, for instance. How does that kind of play out, the kind of tension between collaboration in the early stage and competition to get to market? Or you said you sit on the board of some well, other companies. Maybe there isn't competition. In no, no, there's competition, all right. <laughs> uh, and anyway, the shareholders want to make lots of sure. money, right? Yeah. So, um, but we share quite a lot. And by that, I mean, when PT PTC124 have always been ahead, but it only treats 5 to 10% of patients. But if we didn't have PTC124 and the armory that they had to, to deliver things to the clinic, we wouldn't have clinics or we wouldn't have patient registers. So essentially, they've paved the way. They, I mean, how do you measure endpoints uh, in trials? You know, the six-minute walk, which is how far these kids can walk yeah. in a given time, 
uh, all developed by PTC, so we can piggyback on what they developed. Uh, and there's, they're actually very friendly. Uh, they share as much of their data that they can reasonably share with us to enable our trials to be more effective. And is that, do you think, because people think there's a, there isn't a single bullet, silver bullet, to cure this or to uh, treat yes. this? It's going to be a combination of, of the things that are being developed. And also PTC recognise that they can only address a certain number of patients. Sure. Uh, and yeah. we can address them all. But I don't know how, effort, you know, and I don't suppose theirs will work in every patient, but then that's true of any drug that you take. Okay. Um, the, so the wider topic, though, of kind of commercialization of science, I mean, we, we've, we've discussed that a little bit there for a moment, but do you think spin-outs from universities are the best way to get from kind of bench to bedside to maximize the impact of relevant research? Yes, I do. And I think that's because of the close synergy between what a, a small company can offer and the academics. I mean, and it is a different way of working, there's no question. Mm. And if you have a small company like that, we really, we as academics understand everything about muscle and muscle disease and the animal models we've been working on for the last 25 years. And they understand much more about how can you deliver that, what does a druggable molecule really look like? There's no point in doing this. Uh, I mean, somebody said to me yesterday, I asked him, actually I was interviewing somebody uh, for a job in innovation, and I said, is it better to work with CROs or academics? And he said CROs, because academics never do what you want them to do. <laughs> well, that's actually part of that. Did you get true. the job? <laughs> I won't tell you the answer to that. But I think it's, uh, it's interesting. But, yeah. but you can get your group gradually uh, to have that mindset. Mm. And some of them, when they first get junior postdocs, when they first come in, <coughs> feel a little insecure with that, because they don't think there's an opportunity for innovative research. And they fast realize there's probably more rather than less. But it's much more team working. Mm. But, but, I, but I, I, one potential downside maybe to the spin-out is, of course, it, it, it is driven by and depends on market economics. Yes. And often um, that drives you know, cures and treatments for diseases that are of a particular size, a particular size of market to be able to address. It doesn't necessarily pay heed to the severity or the, the suffering of the patient. Right. Um, <coughs> how does... I mean, you, you have orphan drug designation for... Right. Um, but we've gone through dips where it's very difficult to find money. In fact, one of our recent investors asked me, why did we keep going? And the answer is, I've never done an experiment that's told me this approach will not work. Right. And therefore, you have to be tenacious. You just have to keep, as then as an academic for a bit, you have to keep doing the experiments that you know eventually will provide the evidence to get more investors uh, to mm -hmm. come in. And actually, that's what's happened. Okay. And now we've got, I mean, we're in a really exciting phase because PTC's gone into the clinic. ProSense has just made people an awful lot of money. Uh, by being taken over by Biomarin, so Exxon skipping, even if it's not going to be the final product that will give the, the real if, uh, efficacy in that particular approach, gives people hope that this will work. Uh, and, and, and just make <coughs> one further point, uh, for cystic fibrosis, they're just getting uh, things into the clinic now, and that again has been a partnership between the CF Foundation, mainly in the States, the raising money and working alongside uh, Vertex and other companies. And I think it is that, it, it's, it's the patients, the patient group setting up the registries, getting the right patients properly phenotyped so you can get real outcomes for some of these clinical trials that helps. And that's really what we've got in DMD, but quite a lot of that is because of PTC124 trailblazing ahead of us. Mm. But it's interesting that, that large pharma is not near any of this at the moment. It's being done by a combination of self-funded biotechs and CROs. Yeah. But it was. I mean, GSK funded ProSensor for a time, and then their phase three failed, and they withdrew. Mm. Um, I think they're just now waiting. I'm hoping they are waiting in the wings there for us just to do that final uh, proof of concept, and then they'll pick it up. Because we certainly couldn't take it phase two, phase three. We'd have to partner. Uh, with big pharma, but much of the early stage work is, you know, as, as large pharma are pulling out of internal R and D in that early stage. Is yeah, but they're not of rare diseases because they know they can make a lot of money from mm. rare. Well, for the moment, they can make a lot of money out of rare diseases, and that's why Biomarin took over ProSensor in spite of that phase three failure because they know how much good data they'd got coming along. And you know, SMTC1100 is a very good molecule, but it won't be the one in the end. And we've got some really exciting data now that uh, we haven't published yet, of course. Uh, and I'm not just saying it's true. Uh, but you have to. You have to have these follow-up molecules mm. that, because a lot of these things fall over 
and you need to have something to take its place all the time. Mm. Okay, great. Um, change the topic again slightly. Mm -hmm. um, women in science. I, I, I don't know if this is a question you get tired of being asked or if, you, if it's important and high on your agenda of things to discuss. Um, but you, you, obviously you're the director of the MRC Functional Genetics Unit, you're governor of Wellcome Trust, director of the Oxford Centre for Gene Function. It, it, what is representation like on those boards? And what's Bad. Your I mean, there are difficulties. There are very s few senior women. There used to be very few senior women in Oxford, so you tend to be asked to be on all the committees. Uh, and you have to be careful of that, otherwise you'll be swamped. Yeah. Um, I don't mind talking about it because it's improved so much over the last 25 years. When Steve went to Paris, I had to write a letter to an Oxford college that's remained nameless to say I wouldn't follow him uh, for at least a year. So I waited a year and then followed him. Um, uh, but they, I mean, that's, that's illegal now. Yeah. And I still think women don't, uh, men, I don't think are necessarily uh, gender bias. It's unconscious bias, if you like. They just. They think of scientific meetings and they never think of the women. It's a bit like the Royal Society in the end. We decided to come out with a list of people in the Royal Society that were women, because if you went through the book, you'd find there weren't many women, well, less than 10% at that time. Uh, so who do you nominate for prizes? They never thought of the women, because yeah. you only had 10% of them. Yeah. And I think that's what, uh, <coughs> what you've got to keep promoting. And you do still have to promote it. So f through the Wellcome Trust, I'm arranging a Women's Day, but not just scientists. This happens in business. The American business women will tell you it's really bad because this, this people don't think of women in these roles. Mm. And there's no question credibility matters. If you put your glasses on, you're more credible. <laughs> I used to put my hair up, but it's not long enough now, so I don't do that anymore. But it is. Yeah. <coughs> so other than putting your glasses on and putting your hair up, if there's, so we have a delegation from local school here, and all interesting, budding young science pupils. What other advice would you give to younger women looking to break into science as a long-term career for them? Well, I, th I think it's getting a lot better. So I, don't, I think when you get to the top, it's, it is, does get tougher, but it gets tougher for men too. Sure. And I think you just have to remind people, and you have to network with other women. Although my m main mentors have been men, they haven't been women. Um, mm. uh, but I was supported by a very strong husband who really wanted, if I wanted to do this, he would recognise that, that and he would throw me back in. Mm. Um, and I was very fortunate in Sydney, Brenner, when he interviewed me for a fellowship when I was working in London, said, this is completely stupid, Davis, you shouldn't be commuting on a train every day. I'll organise for you to have a lab in Oxford, and he did. So mm. there are, uh, you know, circumstances, I think, if you put yourself forward. Uh, but I also think it's about confidence. And you won't believe this, but I was not very confident. And, and, and I think most people are not that confident, really. And you've just got to be, not be knocked back. And also, if someone is unpleasant or sexist, makes a sexist remark, actually, you've just got to forget it just and ignore move it and on. Get on. Yeah. Because there's nothing more boring than someone that complains all the time. And then try and find out why. Mm. Um, but, you know, we have these so-called Athena Swan initiatives in the universities, which has really changed the culture. Uh, and, the, you know, the law in Belgium is that all companies have to have 30, by 2016, have to have 30% of their boards women. I was going to ask about a quota-driven policy. Yeah, do you, and do I you don't think believe in positive discrimination. Yeah. I think that makes it very difficult. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a need to be there on merit as well. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So finally, um, we've talked a bit about um, translational research and, and your research. Obviously, your, your roles on the various boards that I've listed there gives you a, a wider picture. You've, you've yeah. touched on that yeah. briefly. I'd be interested to know your opinion on how you think UK research compares to the rest of the world currently, where we are in terms of the, kind of the amount, the quality, the talent, the, and the trend. Which right. way is that going? I can tell you the answer to that with my Wellcome Trust hat on because we've looked at it. Right. The best value is in the UK by far because the, for the buck in, the buck out, the number of citations, we beat the Americans by miles. Not in every field, but the generalisation, that's definitely true. We need to maintain the infrastructure to make sure that that really is true. And the real problem is, of course, a lot of the big pharma are moving out. Mm. So your point you made earlier on about delivery and the fact that we don't have enough venture capitalists around to actually want to fund. So I have to say, Summit has a base in Boston for exactly that reason. You have to go out and fundraise beyond the UK shores at the moment, otherwise you're not going to get there. You don't raise enough money. 
And is that a, is that a, a failing of public sector or is it a, a due to a lack of, um, or due to risk adversity from, from venture investors in the UK? No, what, what do you think that which is It's general by? within academia. There's much more philanthropic giving within the States, for example, sure. than there is here. Yeah. But, you know, investing is international, so it shouldn't matter. Yeah. And I think some of the, you know, I'm not, this is not a, a statement in support of the present government. I think even the Labour government did very well in supporting science and setting up uh, places where we, these hubs, BioCity, are all uh, aided by uh, initiatives that have been promoted by the government. And I think there is a realisation now, whether it's biology, physics, engineering or whatever, that we need to invest in that way. Mm and that we need to fail. I mean, we're very conservative. First yeah. of all, we know when I set up a company, uh, they, all my academic friends thought I was completely nuts and actually were fairly snotty about it too. They, did, they you know, just didn't think this was really academic. And Is over it? the last 15 years, that's really changed because they come and ask me, well, how do you do it, Kay, now, which yeah. they wouldn't do before. It's funny, isn't it, that there's almost an intellectual vanity that isn't yeah, satisfied absolutely. by being in business. Yeah. It's because business is slightly dirty compared to... Yep. Academic research, yeah. And, and we've talked a little bit about that fragmentation, so large pharma not doing the early stage research, universities, CROs, small biotechs. There is a shortage of funding, but do you think there's that kind of changing landscape offers significant opportunities to people in that space as well? Well, I think it's also much more exciting for young people because you can join these companies and, you know, you may not have a job for three or four after the first three or four years, but there'll always be another exciting company that's developing a different technology because technology is changing all the time. Mm. So actually, big pharma couldn't afford to have this in-house all the time. So every time there's a new uh, way of doing things, you know, if you can edit the genome, some, something called CRISPR has just been developed, and there's a whole series of little companies that suddenly sprung up in the last three months. Yeah. And so I don't think there's ever been a more exciting time to do this, uh, um. whatever your idea. And that kind of fragmented, granular nature of that part of the industry now actually leads to agility and speed and response yep. And, yep. and leanness and all the rest of it. And, so. you know, the Diabetic Association, whether it, you know, which isn't a rare disease, the Diabetes Association can bring all those people together. Mm. And they often do inter internationally and annually. And it's that sort of uh, fostering of ideas. And we were all very competitive. But there's quite a lot you can learn from going to those sort of meetings. And you can make alliances, of course. And I think you've probably part answered the, this question as well. But you know, what does kind of UK Life Sciences PLC need to do to ensure that the number of new drugs, therapies, <coughs> diagnostics, um, and wider healthcare innovations are discovered and designed and, you know, and developed in Great Britain? I take more risks, and I think we need better innovation services within universities. I mean... Again, the Wellcome Trust did a survey on this, and I, it's not perfect by any means, and the people in this audience that would know more about this than I do. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult, and we haven't quite got that right. If you go to places like MIT, they really have it right. Yeah, it's a machine and to roll it, out these. It, it, it yeah. absolutely is. Yeah. And the academics really feel they're part of it, even though they let go of companies yeah. uh, quite quickly. And that must be cultural as well, to a degree. If you as an academic have seen yeah. other academics doing it, then you'll absolutely. find more. So it, it's almost an incubator within that. And the same, there's the same problem all over Europe. Yeah, yeah. So fixing that bit, that's the main job. Yes. Well, I think, you know, again, I think the big foundations to replace the sort of philanthropic giving that's happened in the States. So in, not only the medical research councils, but I think some of the big foundations like the Wellcome Trust, like Nova Nordics in Denmark, we ought to think about how can we bring things together uh, to address that translational agenda. Because if we don't do it in partnership, I don't think we will get there, because uh, one single person can't change that ethic. And you think that's pan-European? I think it probably almost is. Almost by necessity? I think it is, yes. Yeah. OK. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, it's probably an appropriate point, as I look at the clock here, to start drawing our conversation to a close. But before we do, I'd like to finish by giving members of the audience a chance to ask a few questions as well. Now, this is going to be challenging for two reasons. One, we don't have a microphone, and two, I can't see a thing no. <laughs> beyond the first row. So um, I'm going to ask, um, so we can repeat any questions that get asked, um, but if you wouldn't mind, if you'd stand up, um, say who you are, and please speak up. I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to hear you. So stand up, own up, and speak up. Is there anybody who'd like to ask a question of Professor Davis? Gentleman in the second row. David Browning from City. Professor Davis, I was intrigued by one of your points around the, um, one of the interventions for DMD, 
where you stated that diet had an effect on the efficacy of the intervention. And it led me to think about going forward, do you think there's going to be a need for a more personalised approach to conditions such as DMD? And if so, do you think that's going to require perhaps collaboration between a wider group, for example, in this case dietitians, perhaps physios as well as researchers specific to the field? And okay. do you think there'll be challenges in or opportunities to really harness that? So okay. more of a personalised medicine, I guess. Right. Well, I'll, I'll answer the personalised question. Uh, I slightly misled you because it's the bioavailability of the drug that's the problem. We didn't get enough actually in the serum. That's why we had to check because uh, Duchenne patients, t we didn't realise, tend to have a low fat diet and we needed to make it a high fat diet. Ideally, you would not take a drug to the clinic that depended on diet. You'd have the follow on compound that doesn't depend on diet. But your point about personalised medicine, uh, yes, each one of these will depend, will be, well, our approach won't because just increasing the level of this protein is applicable to all patients. But there will be 10% that will be uh, cured by this PTC124, another 13% that will have the exon skipping uh, protocol that's currently available. So it will be personalised, and that will actually affect the price of the drug as well, of course. So I think um, uh, it will always have to be subdivided. Now, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the business plan works for companies, which is why GSK got interested, which is why Pfizer is developing uh, drugs in this space. Because essentially, if you look at cancer, that's personalised now. If you do the mutations, you can see that, you, you know, look at breast cancer. Uh, there are drugs very specific depending on what, your, what growth factors <coughs> you happen to have in your particular tumour. And as you get down to the rarer cancers, exactly the same will be true. So when we've sequenced 100,000 genomes, you'll see that there will be lots of these. Uh, the question is whether we can find generic pathways that might be applicable to several of these diseases. But it'll be personalised because it'll depend on your genome sequence. Thank you. Uh, another question. Gentleman at the back here on the, on the right-hand side. Gwen Taylor, Nottingham Tread. How do you spin out companies outside of the Golden Triangle attract investment from the venture capital industry? That's an interesting question. <laughs> um, well, I think certainly the government has set up these catapult sites to try and uh, get people together. I think we have to do it by networking. Uh, and it's a bit like, I, th I, th I think you just have to do it by networking. So you need to have more uh, workshops on, well, I don't like talking shops. Mm. You, you really need to have examples and you need to introduce those to uh, people uh, for, for uh, well, you have to introduce them to particular fund managers. Uh, and I think that's the only way. Yeah, yeah, personal connections. It's, it is personal connections. I mean, I think we would not have got started if it, I mean, we didn't know these people. Um, it's just that, you know, friends of friends again, and we just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And I think that's what you have to do. Glenn, you were going to ask a question. And there are just as many people oh. in bigger states around here, because it's a much <coughs> nicer place to live up north than it is in <laughs> grubby old London now. So there must be some people out there that really want to put their money back. Now, I see some of those because actually through my Oxford College, where I've never raised money, but you go to some of those Gordies and you realise a lot of these people have made a hell of a lot of money. And they've all retired at 50 and they're wondering what to do next. And we have to tell them what to do next or advise them. How, but sensibly, because I, I mean, how much risk do they want to take? And then I think there's some good stories in UK, UK PLC now where they could, and then, you know, not, not just the big ones, mm. like the antibodies. The, there are other very good examples of where this has worked. Thank you. So I, I wonder if you could explain um, how, what goes wrong in Duchenne muscular dystrophy? What, what, what is it that uh, causes the, the deterioration? Well, in simplistic terms, dystrophin actually is a stabiliser of the muscle membrane. So when you stretch your muscle, it's got to come back in perfect alignment to be stretched again. And if you don't have dystrophin, then you start getting misalignment. And so eventually you'll get tears in the membrane and then you'll get infiltration of all the proteases that destroy your muscle. So the real uh, problem, and that's probably why you don't see it at birth. I mean, if you knew to test it, you could see that they have got significant muscle damage even at birth, but it doesn't manifest itself until they really start to use their muscles. And then it becomes uh, very apparent. 
Come at the front. I'm Jonathan Burroughs from Creative Places. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to elaborate a little for us on the way in which innovation services might be expanded and worked on within universities to help as you're <coughs> suggesting is required. And secondly, whether institutes, uh, same goes for institutes, and whether the Wellcome Trust are perhaps helping with some of their institutes. Right, well, um, I think the most important thing is to have the innovation office embedded in the academic research because one of the points that was made when we were having a conversation earlier on is that most people don't know what's going on. So if you wanted to know, this is the example that was used earlier, who was working on microRNAs, just to take one example, and somebody went to the University of Oxford, even I wouldn't know. And I'm pretty well networked. So I think, you know, uh, you need to, and that's what they do in uh, MIT, the actual... Mm. Uh, people that are going to exploit the science are embedded, turn up to some of the seminars. So they really understand what's going on in immunology, in inflammation, in muscle disease, etc. And I think that's what we need to do. I think um, also innovation in the university. No university has made a hell of a lot of money by investing in companies. That's not what they're there for. And then one of the biggest problems is the central universities think they're going to make a lot of money from this. And what they do is they cripple some of these young companies by charging them or wanting money back much too soon instead of taking a broader brush approach and saying, I'm going to invest in these 20 companies. And in 10 years, one of those may be a real blockbuster. Mm. And they haven't yet crossed that line, uh, I think, in that understanding. <laughs> I hope I'm not doing any disservice to anybody. But I think even in Oxford, you know, ISIS innovation had to make money when Tim Cook was running it, and he did make some money. But he's, he's a, you know, you've got to get all these licenses back. Well, you could just say, well, I'll have it back, but you'll have to pay me more money, but in 10 years. And that allows the company to mature properly. And I think that's, that's how perhaps one of the differences, actually, between the UK, Europe, and America, where there's less pressure of that kind. And I've forgotten what the I'm other sure. bit of question was about the Wellcome Trust. Could you yeah. just repeat what you... Well, institutes like the Sanger Institute, yeah. for example, whether yeah. you're helping to pioneer some of those advances that are required. We're pushing like hell. No, I think the problem has been that the Sanger Institute, for all its investment, has not actually come out with a company until just recently. And now it has Congenitor 14M. We set up an arm called Syncona within the Wellcome Trust to go out and take a long-term view of what we perceive to be good science within our portfolio. So we do have to be proactive. Uh, and we did actually commission a review, which we haven't uh, published yet, on innovation within the UK uh, sector, university sector. I look forward to reading that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it'll be very informative. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think we've time for one last question. The gentleman on the second row. Stefan Opodinsky, Biostatus. I was interested in your comments about the venture capital, the state of venture capital industry in the UK and the differences between the UK and the US. But what you didn't mention was the, the East. And, and I just wondered whether or not you had uh, dabbled in the East and your perspectives on trying to sort of um, form collaborations with China and other well, I haven't gone as far as Asia, but Oxford certainly has set up a fund that does include Qatar and uh, various investors in the Arabian countries. They may not be as rich as they used to be <laughs> at the moment, um, but we've stretched that far. We haven't stretched as far as China. I think we're rather nervous about whether they'll just take all our IPR and then just exploit it. Um, but that may develop in that direction. So we wouldn't say no to that, but I think it's probably too early to make those sort of relationships. But certainly beyond Europe and beyond the States is where we need to try and get investment. I think the other thing is that, um, this is a point that comes up, Singapore put an awful lot of money into institutes and tried to get tech transfer. And that experiment didn't work. And that's because institutes are pretty sterile places after 10 years. And universities are where this should happen in combination with institutes that might be embedded. For example, I think the Sanger Institute, which does all these genome sequences, has hugely benefit from having associate fellows that work within universities now. And quite a lot of their translational programs are coming from these partnerships. So, uh, and actually, it's young people. 
you have to have access to really bright young people who have this idea from the far left side. And if you don't actually integrate it with the university and you set up an institute, you're equivalent to a you know, mini company, if you like. Uh, I don't mean institutes aren't entirely successful. I mean, look at LMB. And, but LMB is embedding itself within Adam Brooks Hospital, within the academic environment, where it will probably flourish even better than it did before. Mm. Professor Davis, thank you so much. It's, it's been a real pleasure to have you here, to be able to sit and, and chat with you like this. Um, uh, I, I know you're an inspiration for many um, in the world of science, women in science and, and men equally. Um, and um, I'd like to thank you for your candor, your insights and sharing some of your wisdom with us this evening. I'm sure we will all leave a bit more enlightened and a lot more motivated. So I'd just like to ask everybody to join me in saying a big thank you for joining us this evening. <laughs> I'd like to add my thanks to uh, Professor Dame Kay Davis. Uh, thank you so much. That was really interesting, inspiring. Uh, thanks also to Toby, who did a, did a great job, I think. So. Uh, no flowers for you, though, I'm afraid, Toby. Um, I'd just like to say a few things. Um, as as Lou has already mentioned, BioCities had a very successful year. But our focus, first and foremost, is on the success of companies. And it is everything that I say to the people that work in the BioCity team all the time. The mantra that we repeat is, will it make the companies more successful at BioCity? And, and if we can say yes to that, then it's something that we'll try and do. And that drives everything. And that's not because um, we're wonderfully pure philanthropic people. That's because the more successful the companies are at BioCity, the more successful BioCity is. And we're driven by that company success. But that's, that is fundamental to everything that we do. And there are some fantastic success stories that we have here at BioCity. And Louis already mentioned you know, the survival rate of the companies at 91% versus about 60% over, over just three years across the UK in the life science sector. That's something that we really should be shouting about more and more. But I want to particularly talk about a number of particular success stories that we've had here at BioCity. Companies that have made it through a really important 10-year milestone and they've become really thriving and successful businesses in their own right. And we thought that milestone, that 10-year milestone, really shouldn't go unrecognized. And so we've got a small mark of commemoration for each of these companies. And I'm going to ask them to stand, step up and uh, collect it if, um, if they're here. So firstly, we've got North 51. Uh, North 51 developed web-based tools for the healthcare sector. And Phil Randall started out here um, with a team of, I think it's about five people, um, in a, an office just up on the second level in this building, almost directly above here. Um, they now take a whole wing of the, the building, and uh, I'm not sure how many people they have in here, but it's a substantial amount of people, very highly regarded in, in the sector, an incredibly successful business. So is Phil here or somebody from the, the um, North 51 team? Next, we've got um, Signature. Uh, and Signature's grown to become one of the most highly regarded medchem companies in the country. Simon Hurst, the founder, again started out in this building with just a few people. Um, that was 10 years ago. And the company has grown to well over 100. They take the top two floors of 
building you can't really now see across the car park, but continuing to grow and expand, fantastic success story. And uh, I'd like to ask, is Simon here or one of the signature team to come up and collect there? Trudell Medical specializes in res respiratory diseases, and over the years, Richie Sharp has steadily built his team across Europe, and Richie is, is one of those people who has been a pleasure to have around in the community here at uh, BioCity and really adds a lot of value to the whole community. So it's great to have him he he here, great to have him been here for 10 years. Uh, Richie, you, as you said, you really can't see anything out here at all. Next up, we have Medilink. Medilink, uh, many of you will know as the trade organization for the life sciences here in the East Midlands. And Medilink's done a lot of valuable work, um, most significantly in getting the funding stream that started out as the INET and provides uh, a lot of support in developing innovative companies and in funding them and providing grants for companies and for also translation of technology from the universities. And, uh, that Medilink has developed here, started out pretty much the same time as, as BioCity, developed and grown into a very <coughs> successful team doing what they do for the sector. And so Medilink, anybody? Uh, Keith is, I'm sure I saw him here somewhere. <laughs> then we have uh, uh, Adamson Jones. Uh, Adamson Jones started out at BioCity actually just along the corridor from North 51. Um, so maybe there's something special about that space because Adamson Jones quickly outgrew the space that they had. Uh, Adamson Jones, uh, a very important aspect to the community here at BioCity because one of the things that we decided to do right at the, the outset was focused not simply on the companies that are doing the research in the labs, which is obviously the fundamental to everything that we're all about, but also if you want to build a successful business, it's about the intellectual property, the finance, the regulatory affairs, and all those different elements that make a successful business. So having good quality intellectual property uh, specialists like Adamson Jones here on site has been extremely important, and I know a lot of the companies here benefit from that experience. Adamson Jones has grown, as I say, from uh, a small office here in this building. I mean, now they have got a significant team over in one of our later buildings across the car park. So if Steve is here, it would be great if we could come up too. So then we have Renesai. Um, Renesai is one of the few companies here, here at BioCity that actually existed before BioCity existed um, and came into being from uh, BSF. So the founding uh, three, a team of three, uh, Rob Jones, uh, David Heal, and Sharon Cheatham, uh, came out of the, the research that was going on here at BSF when the site was closed. And they've built a, a great business in preclinical uh, studies. Now, I know they're highly respected also across the whole of the pharmaceutical field. 
So if uh, somebody from Renaissance is here and like to come up and, and collect their... Then we have uh, Orthogem. Um, Orthogem has developed a synthetic bone graft material, and it's been a long slog for, for that company. Um, and really, it's an interesting case study because there have been other companies that have been doing something similar to Orthogem that, uh, if you speak to anybody in Orthogem, will say they don't have anywhere near as good a technology as, as Orthogem. But it's a good example of what happens when, you, when a company needs a greater investment of cash. So there was a similar company uh, to Orthogem based down in London, had some significant investment at the very early stages and subsequently has grown, developed quite rapidly and was acquired. And with Orthogem, it's been bootstrapped and it's been a real slog. But they've got there in the end, but I think it's taken longer for them to, to do that because of the shortage of cash. And that's why we need to continue to build the financial resources that we have here in Nottingham and the East Midlands to be able to put significant amounts of investment into companies like Orthogem and others so they can get ahead and not spend their whole time trying to raise the next tranche of funding, but they have the freedom to actually go and develop the science and develop the product. Um, Orthogem, I don't think, are, are here this evening, so I get to keep the, the champagne. Um, but we should give them a clap anyway for... And uh, finally, FDAS. Um, I remember Larissa Taylor, the founder of SDS, F FDAS, coming along in the very early days of BioCity with an idea to develop a, an analytical company. Um, and we worked on that and de developed that and refined that. Uh, but they managed to get uh, some initial investment through the, the Regional Venture Capital Fund, and that got the company off onto a good start and because it's a service type company, they're able to, to get it off on a relatively small amount of capital. And they have uh, grown successfully and become a very well-established and also well-respected <coughs> company in the analytical field, providing services to a wide range of pharmaceutical companies and uh, larger biotechs. Uh, again, I don't think anybody from FDS is here, but uh, again, let's give them a round of applause. So finally, I would like to say thank you to Gemma, uh, who has done uh, a lot of the work in leading the team that put all this together today. And um, there's a lot more to come. If you come upstairs, there is some amazing stuff going on in some of the, the rooms upstairs where you get to see a taste of each of the BioCity sites, um, but also to see some of the companies that are based at the different BioCity sites. <laughs> But I'm hoping that, yes. <laughs> and I would like to thank the whole of the BioCity team. I don't get to do this very often, so I'm going to make the most of it, I'm afraid. Um, they work incredibly hard to achieve the successes that we've had, particularly over in the last year. And uh, so thank you to everybody in the team. We've got a great executive team here. But every single person on the whole BioCity team works extremely hard and, and is really devoted to the cause of helping to make the companies here more successful. And at the risk of this being a bit of a love-in, I'd also like to mention our chairman, uh, Louis, who works well over and above the, the call of duty to support BioCity and the companies here. So I'd just like to take this opportunity again, something that we don't do very often, but to thank Louis for, for his, all his hard work. Yeah.
And that really draws the proceedings to a close down here. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you all for, for coming. Please stay around, go up to one floor to where we've got uh, drinks, canapes, and you get to experience the, the Bar City extravaganza of taste and sound and touch and whatever the other senses are. So <laughs> please have a, have a great, great Christmas. Uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the evening, and thank you very much for coming. <laughs>